There's a fourth feature of these uh, despotisms of the 21st century, and it has to do with their reliance upon periodic elections. It's a great par paradox for uh, many observers. Uh, one could even speak of uh, these uh, despotisms as sephocracies. That word also exists in the Oxford uh, Dictionary, and it's a word that's been championed by Ashish Nandi, the Indian scholar, to describe one of the dangerous trends in India. A sephocracy is where there is a certain fetish made of elections and winning elections to prove that actually you have legitimacy in the eyes of the people whom you dominate. Uh, we could ask, why does the arch-despot Bashar al-Assad announce the staging of a presidential election scheduled for June the 3rd? Is it because, as the western Back National Coalition Opposition Group thinks, because he lives in, as they put it, a state of separation from reality, a state of denial? I think the answer is no, or not necessarily, because among, among the strange and distinctive qualities of despotism is its knack of cultivating popular legitimacy. Elections are one way of doing this. From Belarus to Brunei, from Azerbaijan to Kuala Lumpur, despotisms embrace the institutional facades of electoral democracy. Why do they do this? Why do they universalize the franchise except for those cases, there are only five left on the face of the earth where women are not entitled as uh, to be the equals of men, uh, and they include Brunei, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. Why, why this um, embrace of electoral democracy? Why is it that they uh, want to stage so-called free and fair elections? Well, they are rarely that. They practice the dark arts of manipulation, to be sure. They exclude candidates considered undesirable. They sensationalize media events. They buy votes. They intimidate voters. There is gerrymandering. There is the alter alteration of electoral lists. There's the miscounting and the disappearance of ballots. Despotisms do all this for a variety of clever reasons, but they're not just cynical exercises in propaganda massi massage plebiscites. Because, I put it to you, elections are useful instruments of despotism. For instance, they enable dissenters in the governing hierarchy some room for maneuver, however temporary. Electoral contests can offer low-cost exit options for discontented regime politicians. Elections are ways of distributing patronage to, uh, as it were, oil uh, the machinery of the patron-client relations that I spoke about earlier. Elections allow despots to identify opponents uh, so that elections serve as sort of early warning detectors of disaffection. Elections uh, can enable the settlement of certain disputes. For opposition political parties, uh, usually the calling of an election uh, presents uh, and produces something of a crisis. Not to be involved in the elections, to boycott the elections, is to heap uh, 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 doubt on the, the legitimacy of those parties. To participate in those elections and to lose proves that the despots, after all, are the much more uh, popular. So elections, in other words, uh, function to display uh, the awesome celebration of the mighty and incontestable power of the regime. Uh, the razzmatazz of elections, one could say, is a chance for everyone to behave as if they believe in the regime through some kind of election contract. Of course, staging elections can be risky. When despotic rulers hold elections, they expected to win, but things can go wrong, as happened in 2009 in Iran. And at that point, uh, despots have to resort to election stealing. Feeling. And failing all else, the last word they have to have in a hail of truncheons and bullets. Uh, and the last word goes to the police and the army. And under those circumstances, the exercise of electoral democracy, to paraphrase Oscar Wilde, comes to mean something like the bludgeoning of the people by the rulers of the people for the claimed good of the people. Uh, fifth feature. All of these despotisms that I'm beginning to describe to you are unusual because they rely on the rhetoric of democracy. There are constant references to the people, to the sovereign people. 
here we come close to the so-called democratic qualities of the 21st century despotism. The cleverest despots know that though it's important to have the secret police and censors and the army on their side, they must also acknowledge the fundamental principle, as Hannah Arendt once put it, that it is the people's support that lends power to the institutions of any country. Uh, you can see in these uh, despotisms of the 21st century at work something like a silent or an unwritten or a tacit contract. The Chinese refer to moshu. Moshu is this presumption that the rulers depend upon the ruled, and the ruled understand that their lives depend on the rulers. It's something like, we rule and deliver you things in exchange for your loyalty to us. These regimes, ladies and gentlemen, are not fascist regimes of the early 20th century. There are no mass mobilizations. Uh, the people, however, are expected to uh, obey, to admire power, and they are expected to keep their heads down and not to busy themselves with matters of politics. But what is striking about these regimes is just the popularity of the vernacular language of the people and of the sovereign uh, people. Even in uh, those absurd moments where things are done in their name. For instance, when there is a crackdown, as happened uh, several times in recent years in the province of Xinjiang in western uh, China, where a form of martial law is imposed, it is done in the name of the people, or what officials call a people's war. Uh, Yu Hua, in a wonderful book on China called China in Ten Words, notes that there's no other expression in, modern, in the modern Chinese language that is such an anomaly in that the people are ubiquitous yet somehow invisible. And I think that's the point. Despotisms thrive on representations of the people as a living phantom. They are, in the imaginary of despotism, both being and non-being, of supreme political importance and of no importance at all. Sixth quality of these 21st century despotisms is their embrace of permanent campaigning. This is uh, an odd development, to say the least. But what I want to say is that despots learn that diction and decor, manners and charm, are vital ingredients, ingredients of successful politics. Their mode of rule embraces the aesthetics of the permanent campaign, the kinds of permanent campaigns that have begun historically to be uh, normal in so-called Western democracies. Despots step out from behind closed doors. They go walking among the people. Uh, you may know in recent weeks uh, that moment where Putin, on board a Russian naval ship, calls out to uh, the naval uh, 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 personnel assembled on ships uh, and on shore. He calls them comrades, comrades. And they uh, reply to him, hail, hail. This is, this is uh, a walkabout campaign in which the people people uh, figure centrally in the whole rhetoric of uh, appearance. That is to say, uh, despots uh, go walking on the catwalk, so to say. They try to use uh, public appearances to divine support for them. And in this sense, you can see uh, the novelty in, for instance, uh, the uh, walkabouts of Xi Jinping. It's one of the qualities of this new Chinese leadership. Here he is in a steamed dumpling shop. Or have a look at um, uh, something also uh, novel. Uh, it's called showboating in China. Here is the first lady, Peng Liuan, uh, who is the first ever uh, lady in uh, Chinese uh, political history since 1949, who herself has brought a certain proto-democratic style for the first time into the field of high-level diplomacy and foreign policy. So journalists comment on the way she dresses, the way she walks, what she says in English, uh, how she uh, curtsies or not. Uh, this is now all uh, part of Chinese uh, domestic politics and global politics as well. And it is, I think, a symptom of one of the big changes that is going on and is part and parcel of uh, these uh, 21st century despotism seventh. Under conditions of despotism, the powerful must never be seen naked. There is a lot of pretense 
And there's a lot of cultivation of the art of pretense. You may know the principle of wissy-wig. Wissy-wig is what you see is what you get. Well, it doesn't apply to these 21st century de despotisms. What people see or hear or read is not what they get. So the wise subjects of despotism are people who cultivate the art of interpreting what is called dog whistling, or what the Italians called uh, di dietrologia, or behindology. That is, they cultivate the art of decoding surface or official explanations in order to grasp the behind or the dietro. The most sophisticated new despotisms, one could say, strive to have a Dolce and Gabbiano and Givenchy appearance. They mount the catwalk. Dominant media, especially uh, television, radio, and print, are used as the medium of political performance. The field of the internet is another matter, which I shall mention in a moment. Despotisms are what I've called mediocracies. That is, corporate media, journalism, advertising, government, public opinion polling merge and meld uh, to the point where organized media and political power appear to be twins. And there are various uh, political economy reasons for why this happens, but it's as if despots try to turn their political regimes into works of art. Let me mention the case of Abu Dhabi. You may know that it is capital city of the United Arab Emirates. It's ranked as the richest city in the world. Uh, it's Abu Dhabi, or at least its royal family rulers, have pulled out all stops to transform its reputation as one of the world's largest oil producers and to transform it into a new skyscraper Hollywood of the 21st century. It's home to Etihad Airways. It's home to state-controlled mosques and nearly a million people including a wealthy middle class and a large majority of ununionized and often badly treated migrant workers. Abu Dhabi has become a haven for global media conglomerates. There are huge oil and gas revenues and sovereign wealth funds, the world's largest, and these have been pumped into Abu Dhabi media. The state-owned group that owns and directs much of the domestic media, including the world's first fiber uh, uh, optic home-to-home -home network. Mobile phone services, newspapers, television, radio stations, including one that is devoted to readings from the Quran. Abu Dhabi Media has working partnerships with Fox International uh, Channels, a unit of News International. Uh, it enjoys Arabic language program with such giants as National Geographic and Comedy Central. Abu Dhabi Media also hosts Imagination, a body which underwrites the production of feature films. There is an office park a free zone project called 2454, named after the city's geographical coordinates, which houses foreign news agencies, including CNN, which produces a daily news show for its global channel. For culture consumers, as you know, there's the government-controlled Abu Dhabi Exhibition Center, the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, the Abu Dhabi Classical Music Society, and there is the Abu Dhabi Cultural Foundation. And of vital strategic importance to the ruling authorities in the UAE is the government market marketing and entertainment body called Flash Entertainment. Put simply, we make people happy, is its motto when advertising big name acts like Beyonce, Christine Aguilera, George Michael, and Aerosmith. Vex questions about whether or to what extent the citizens and non-citizens of the UAE are happy, what happiness means, or whether they are or their journalist rep representatives are happy, all remain unanswered. The point is that Abu Dhabi is the new Hollywood without the old California governed by leading members of the ruling family, open public monitoring of power is abolished. Citizens, so to say, are rentier citizens, beneficiaries of state guaranteed jobs, transfer payments, and other forms of untaxed income and wealth. Free and fair elections are an ancient thing from yesteryear. Democracy makes no political sense, say the local kingdom rulers privately. It causes unwanted social divisions, they add, hence the priority they give to blocking hundreds of websites considered publicly offensive and routinely cleansing local media infrastructures of pornography and other blasphemous commentaries on the God-given noble blood of the royal ruling family. Eighth, 
The new despotisms are police states with a difference. These are regimes determined to stamp out the first signs of dissent, no matter what the potential cost. In Belarus, President Lukashenko rails against what he calls senseless democracy, while his provocateurs in the KGB, as it's still called in Belarus, beat senseless its opponents. In Kazakhstan, it's recorded that human rights workers have been set upon, their chests bared, and a large X, the mark of the censor, carved on their skin. Putin likes to quote Alexander III to the effect that Russia has only two allies, its army and its navy. In his recent speech about the annexation of Crimea, he went out of his way to emphasize what he called a fifth column, and national traitors who are working to block the forward advance of the motherland. And yes, there are moments when the whole machinery of state repression is mobilized against its perceived opponents. Concentrated violence rains down, as in the ongoing repression of Uyghurs in Xinjiang in Western China, or the brutal suppression of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, or when, around the time of the Sochi Winter Olympics, protesters were greeted with pepper spray, with horse whips, or heavily armed riot police, interior ministry troops, and operatives of the Federal Security Service. In certain situations, fear is a vital lubricant of despotic power, therefore. Um, that's why head despots tend to be paranoiacs. You may know that Putin has a food taster because he, at every meal because he's afraid that he will be poisoned. And why it also happens that enemy thinking flourishes under despotic conditions. For instance, fear of terrorist attacks by Islamic insurgents of the North Caucasus dominated much of the media coverage in Russia in the build-up to Sochi. Yes, despotisms can and are brutal. Their unrestrained violence is sickening. The army and police are at all times on standby, but the violence is concentrated, terrible, measured, outsourced, and until the moment it strikes, a shadowy affair. Despots, if you like, know the famous maxim of Mao Zedong, that political power grows from the barrel of a gun. But the employment of force by 21st century despots is seen to have its limits. Efficient coercion is supplemented with charm, with cool, organized, artful practices of persuasion tinged with violence. Despotisms parade their respect for law while exercising a stranglehold over the judiciary and the legislature supposed to enact the law. Despotisms typically have great constitutions, fine constitutions, and there's much trumpeting of the coming of peace at home as the fruit of the tough enforcement of order through law, what uh, the Kremlin calls in an act of doublespeak, dictatorship of the law. But the reality is that politics at the top degenerates into a permanent coup, a steady evisceration of constitutional precepts and rule of law procedures. No tanks or armored personnel vehicles for this. Through a combination of patron-client relations, bribes, promotions, and sackings, the legal profession and the courts, as in Russia, are notoriously subservient to the reigning political powers. And that's also true because despotisms weaken legislatures and and weakened legislatures strengthen despotism. Trumped up charges and convictions are meanwhile commonplace, sometimes to the point where the malfeasance of police and judicial officials, as in Russia, seem indistinguishable from that of the crooks and the criminals they're supposedly hunting. So uh, in these despotisms, there is something like an economy of violence. Despotisms are skilled at camouflaging their violence. In Russia, for instance, the national government is not principally responsible for orchestrating political violence. Most of it is the work of local political bosses, secret service, uh, uh, plain-closed uh, thugs, and organized crime. Thank you very much for the reminder that I'm going on too long. Um, the methods may be crude, slipping radioactive poison into tea, but the invisibility and selectivity of the forces of violence bear some resemblance, I put to you, the outside sourcing of means of violence and security in actually existing democracies. For example, in the European Union, it is estimated now that well over a million private security uh, officials are operating throughout the European Union. These are largely invisible, and something like that trend uh, takes place in those actually existing uh, democracies. Ladies and gentlemen, 
what are the implications of, uh, oh, I forgot to show you him. Uh, what are the implications of uh, uh, this interpretation of the 23rd, 21st century phenomenon of, uh, of despotism? I think there are several. First of all, I hope my reflections on these new despotisms prompt in your mind's eyes some troubling questions to do with their long-term significance, this long-term drift towards despotism. I've tried to show that these new despotisms are not understandable through the standard terms of political science. They're not defective democracies. They're not delegative democracies. They're not illiberal democracies, Farid Zakaria, that up fail to uphold the rule of law. They're not in between hybrid regimes, they're not semi-democracies, they're not semi-authoritarian regimes or semi-dictatorships. There's something other, there's something new. So the questions are, are these despotisms proof that the end of history, Fukuyama and Third Wave, Huntington, uh, are of the predictions of the triumph of liberal democracy, are these pipe dreams? Yes. Further proof of an old law in the history of democracy that democratic ways of handling power have no historical guarantees or of success or survival and they're much easier to destroy than to build? No doubt. Doesn't the rise of despotism show that contemporary democracies, especially when their market foundations collapse, are quite easily tempted to commit democide? Certainly. Secondly, just as disturbing is the implication implicit in everything I've said tonight, that despotism is not, so to say, just out there in far-flung places, Turkmenistan, at a safe distance from our democracies. Despotism operates close to home in a double sense. It's not just that they help each other. The bazaars of the Central Asian despotisms are full of Chinese goods, or since the coup d'etat in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and Kuwait have pumped an estimated 12 billion into Egypt. Or it's not only that they try to interfere these despotisms with the workings of vibrant monetary democracies. The Chinese authorities excel at what I call the spooking effect. And I've had personal experience of that, or as, as Am Tamimi has shown, how the UAE has tried to pressure the British government into banning the Muslim Brotherhood and Al Hiwa TV channel. But there's another equally troubling trend the quantum entanglement of the spirit and language and political style of monetary democracies and despotisms. I've explained to you that Tocqueville was the first to speculate about this inter interdependence, this interconnection between despotisms and democracy. And tonight, I tried to emphasize the way despotisms mirror and mimic democracies. Think of this, the drift towards plutocracy, talk of the people, permanent campaigning, the hiding away of violence. These are all examples, and they should make us wonder about where our own democracies are heading. Thirdly, and finally, we should tremble at the follies and the pranks, the crazy things produced by these new despotisms. Montesquieu was one who worried about um, the great instability, the, uh, the ruinous effects of despotism, and he thought that this meant that practically every despotism would likely dig its own grave. The despotisms of the 21st century are certainly prone to the disease of hubris, as we could call it. Their habits of arbitrary power go to the heads of their rulers. They induce fantasies of omnipotence and their opposite, surrealistic, dreamlike absurdity. Putin, a leader who has a personal food taster to ensure he's not poisoned, behaves, one could say, like a character in Dead Souls, a novel by Gogol, a story centered on a messianic paradigm of greatness, large size, central control by the state. Meanwhile, in the same week that Field Marshal Abdel Fattah al-Sisi announced he's relinquishing his military leadership role to run for the presidency to save his country, 500 members of the Muslim Brotherhood are sentenced to death in one day in a kangaroo trial presided over by a judge, Said El Ghazar, which I understand in Arabic means the happy butcher. <laughs> then there are figures like Sapa Murat uh, Niyatsov, uh, the Turkmenistan despot, here is his gold-plated uh, statue, who won his, uh, who won his uh, uh, first election, you may know, by 98.3% of the vote. And he then, thereafter, went from strength to strength. He declared himself God's prophet on earth. 
His face stared out from all banknotes, coins, and postage stamps. He ordered his cabinet ministers, not a bad idea, to undertake five-mile-long walks every other day. He banned ballet and opera and cinema. He published a 400-page guide to the people of Turkmenistan. It was called the Runama, passages from which were plastered on mosque walls. He renamed the months of the year. September became Runama, the month when Nyatsov finished writing his magnum opus. He banned listening to car radios, you may know, because he claimed that this would allow uh, the citizens to speak badly of him. And when a string of weather forecasts proved unreliable, he personally dismissed the, the lead weatherman. Oh, and also he banished dogs from Ash uh, Gabat because of their, as he put it, unappealing odor. Nyatsov's megalomania was extreme, but it illustrates the way that those who rule, those who guide and manage despotisms, pass through something like an Alice in Wonderland looking glass into a strange world of shouting sheep and talking flowers, white queens and red kings, hares and hatters, tweedledums and tweedledees. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, the events in Egypt and Crimea, just like the events in Xinjiang and Tibet, should serve as warnings of the damage and devastation that despotisms can bring into the world. We should be worried that some despotisms show signs of trying to turn themselves into enlightened despotisms. This is a topic that I have no longer any time to talk about. That is, they institute mechanisms of learning to perfect their despotism. This is true, for example, in the field of the internet. We need to be on guard, vigilant, wary of the old Montesquieu principle that despotisms always dig their own graves. Um, Abdul Wahab El Masiri knew this world, this well, that the great danger of despotisms is uh, that they are guaranteed by people's willingness to conform, to do nothing, to disrupt the regime and its routines. People who are willing to cultivate blind eyes and cloth ears in the face of the dysfunctions and injustices of the regimes. Durable despotisms turn their subjects into memes or carriers of despotic ideas, ways of speech, and other symbolic practices. But they're managing to do so, and doing so with tenacity, ought in places otherwise as different as Belarus and Hungary, Russia and China, Turkmenistan and Brunei, ought to worry every thinking man and woman who in their guts dislikes every form of arbitrary power. Thank you very much. Very, very powerful arguments, actually, by um, John. I'm not going to comment on John. We have got about 20 minutes, actually, so, and we need to evacuate this place um, half past eight, really, on the dot. Okay. So I'm going to try to be very efficient, and I do want to hear, actually, uh, from people. Um, please, any comments? Make it very short if it's a comment, and questions to John. We've already had one comment. <laughs> we couldn't quite catch what it was. But. Um, can forget about that one. It's not relevant, really. Um, OK, so let's actually have a have few questions from the audience. Don't be shy. OK, just one very, very basic thing. What do we do about it? Um. <laughs> that is a good question. My perception of democracy in this country is that we go to the polls, we put a little cross on a little piece of paper, drop it in the box, all the results are gathered together, and then the people who then put in power completely ignore their policies and go off and do their own thing according to unseen powers and influence. Yeah, what do we do about what it? What do we do about that? Well, I, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm glad that you know, I prompt you to ask that question because um, it's another lecture. But what I tried to do tonight, it was too long-winded. It was the first time. Forgive me for going on and on. Uh, but what I tried to do is to sketch out uh, an image uh, of a, t a type of political form, a type of regime, uh, with those qualities that is identifiable in uh, more than a few contexts 
uh, which is not, so to say, uh, at long distances from us. If you look at Hungarian developments, you will see quite a few of these qualities crystallizing, being politically constructed. And just as happened in the last quarter of the 18th century, what I wanted you to do with this more frightening term, despotism, I hope it frightens you. Maybe you will dream about it tonight. <laughs> uh, this monster of despotism, as Foucault called it. Uh, what I wanted to stimulate is the thought that actually quite a few of these qualities are to be found in our own polities. And in this respect, um, to speak about despotism uh, is to issue some kind of warning. And it is a warning about the acids uh, that actually can eat away at the very structures of democracy as we know and value it. And in particular, and here comes the more positive um, thing, in particular, um, the striking thing for me about these regimes is that they do everything uh, in practice to annihilate independent scrutiny and self-organized power. Scrutiny of power, the monitoring of power, the monitoring of arbitrary power is what they are against. And so the short answer would be, uh, but we could have a very long discussion and another night, uh, I hope it'll be possible. The short answer is um, that the best weapon with which to deal with these regimes is to build uh, scrutiny devices with teeth that actually expose these eight uh, interlocking trends. And how you do that depends, of course, on the context. Uh, in Russia, you know, pussy riot do it in one way, uh, as does the European Court of Justice when trying to figure out what to do about the Hungarian uh, regime. In China, uh, the internet is the, is the point of leverage against all of these trends. And the peoples of Hong Kong and Taiwan feel emotionally uh, powerful things about uh, what I've just been describing, because they don't want that to happen. And they do whatever they can, teaching their children uh, not to accept uh, these, these, these trends, uh, 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 producing works of art, Ai Weiwei, novels, uh, blogs. So, so, you know, this is the resistance to these forms of power has to happen. Um, uh, by people finding their own way in that particular context at that particular time. That's a, that's a, a very short way of, uh, of how to think about how to reverse this trend. But in your question, you revealed that lurking uh, behind my argument is, is this affection for and a whole theory of, uh, of monetary democracy. Uh, and by that I mean that since 1945, um, a major historical change has been going on, positively, in which democracy comes to mean nothing less than free and fair, clean elections, but something much more. The permanent public scrutiny of power wherever it is exercised. And that's what these despotisms, in a curiously democratic way, try to swallow and annihilate. Um, let's have another question. I think we are getting... Um, any other question? Please, go ahead. Um, I'm just interested to know, time may be the exception, but in, in many of the examples that you cite, uh, the de despotism is um, intimately connected with the identity of an individual, a man. So Mr. Nazov or Mr. Putin, or in the case of Iran, the supreme leader, or the royal families. T c is there a difference between, or maybe you'd just like to comment on that? Uh, that, well, there are two. That, that, that it's a despot, yeah. running the despotism. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, first of all, uh, I thought you were going to point out that these are heavily male-dominated, and that's certainly the case. Those are the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, men are good at this. <laughs> men are good at despotism. Um, 
despite what was said in the 18th century, with the, there was a common accusation in, in, in quite a lot of the literature that actually women were running the show. And in this exchange of letters between Abigail and John Adams, I mean, the reason he says we don't want petticoat despotism, because he thinks that men are already subjugated to, to women's will. And this is, a, you know, the um, woman as castrator, woman as femme fatale, I mean, you know, all this imagery. Um, but it may be that uh, it's a really interesting and important question. It may be that that 18th century traditional understanding of despotism needs to be revived because the despot was always a figure, you know, at, at you know, in the seraglio. Uh, I mean, ultimately, the the, the sultan figure who who governed from the top down. Uh, these regimes. Uh, have that constant tendency, you know, the Putins, the Xi Jinpings, um, the Li Keqiangs, uh, the Niatsovs. Uh, I mean, there is this tendency to produce uh, rulers who behave in that way. But if what I had to say tonight has any plausibility, it is that we're talking about a very elaborate architecture of power, a very elaborate, complex, kaleidoscopic um, uh, mode of power, which doesn't um, ultimately depend on the despot. It depends on the percolation of despotic practices throughout the whole regime and beyond that regime. Okay. Do you want to have another go? Just maybe we collect questions. And uh, okay. Let's actually have a few questions before we go ahead. Yeah. Um, right. Thanks. Thanks for this uh, lecture. I would like to know your thoughts or comments on this. Um, it seems to me that this this part of provisions that you're talking about uh, seems to be also, in a sense, kind of maintained or even nurtured by by other form of more subtle despotism that's coming from the West. In fact, it seems that some of the characteristics, the eight characteristics that you mentioned, are shared uh, in some subtle way uh, by Western uh, democracy, say. Right? Mm -hmm. Things like, you know, the economy of violence or other fear, or even the cultivation of, of appearance. Or to, in a sense, moving towards the end of history as put by El Masiri, who seemed to come up with that concept before Fukuyama. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's have another question uh -huh. from uh, yeah. here. Uh, I want to carry on from the previous question. I think uh, the eight characteristics from the idea of life that you described for the category of despotism, uh, we can find mirror image in uh, democracy. But in democracy, you describe them using euphemisms. With despotisms, you describe them with dysphemisms. I don't th so extensionally you can't distinguish between both. I think what was missing was uh, another feature, which could be defined as the concept of a deep state, and maybe that the deep state, and that is what distinguishes uh, despotic regime from an What is a deep state? A deep state is when you have concentrations of power which are hidden in civil societies, in intelligentsia, and non-elected um, um, pivots of power. Uh, chipping, chipping root and set, is it? Yeah, something like that. Let's have another question mm -hmm. from people. Uh, mm -hmm. Any other person? And then John can. Uh, I wanted to ask, because uh, uh, you were looking at American democracy, for example, the power of the people by the common people, the people of for example, the lobbies in general. Can this be seen as presenting uh, the American democracy as some characteristic of uh, despotism, maybe? Mm. OK. Mm. Uh, the last one, to, do you want to go ahead? No? That's it, John, do you want? Uh, well, thank you very much um, for these uh, really sharp questions. I. I I, I think, in a way, they all point to the thesis that one of the great limits of the analysis and the long discussion of authoritarian regimes versus democracies is, is that, empirically speaking, um, they, that very distinction 
uh, fails to see uh, that there are trends within actually existing democracies that point towards uh, the ideal type in practice that I call despotism. And in this sense, I am on the side of the 18th century, the late 18th century, and I'm on the side of Tocqueville. Because to repeat, the warning is, uh, do not be narcissistic about the polity in which you live and which you think of as free and democratic. Um, look into yourselves and see whether, in fact, ask yourself whether some of these corrosive trends are actually found within our own polities. Uh, and a case in point, it's uh, uh, due for a comeback. I hope we will hear much more about it in the coming months and years, is this problem of plutocracy. You may not like the term, uh, but whatever you call it, um, for 40 years now, in actually existing democracies, whether it's India or the United States, uh, or Australia or Sweden. Sweden, by the way, has the highest concentration of billionaires in the whole European uh, region. What we're seeing is this astonishing, by historical standards, uh, gap between the very rich and uh, a large proportion of the population that literally lives from one paycheck to another and doesn't have uh, any capital assets. It has income with hardly any wealth. Um, this is a quality, plutocracy is a quality of these despotisms. It's also a quality of actually existing democracies, and it's not sustainable. Uh, for normative reasons, uh, no democracy can be proud of itself uh, that has this kind of, not Gini coefficient problem, but, but actually a huge imbalance of wealth. Uh, read Piketty and you will see, uh, I mean, with very good data, uh, the kinds of trends that all actually existing democracies are up against. This is not sustainable on normative grounds, and it's probably not sustainable on fiscal grounds, and it's not sustainable in terms of social and political order. Uh, this cannot go on. And, um, but this is a quality that you find, to repeat, in those uh, despotisms. The invisibility of violence. The flourishing um, performance politics, the constant references to the people. I mean, these are senses in which um, the two types, so to say, uh, are integrated, uh, overlap. And therefore, the distinction between authoritarianism and democracy, it seems to me, functions as a sort of ideological uh, uh, dualism. Um, I thought you were going to, um, the gentleman who asked me this question, I thought you were going to uh, ask me about the patterns of Western support for uh, despotisms. Uh, I mean, Turkmenistan, which I sort of described, and it was the only time you laughed, uh, was um, you know, aided and abetted around 9-11 and immediately afterwards by the United States that poured millions into Turkmenistan uh, and did so in, in return for flyover uh, arrangements uh, in the invasion and occupation of, of Afghanistan. Uh, and the kinds of high-level meetings that took place with Nyatsov are sort of, you know, it's, it's just astonishing that uh, a democracy can throw up um, politicians and, uh, uh, and administrators who just completely gush, you know, uh, in, in, in the, the presence of someone who's a, a kind of megalomaniac butcher, uh, a despot, uh, to be sure, in the 21st century uh, sense. Um, I think the point about the deep state is very important. Uh, it's true, I'm working at the moment on China, a lot of us are, and it's true that um, governmental power penetrates very, very deeply uh, through all institutions. Uh, that is a matter of degree, but you can find uh, similar trends within actually existing democracies. Think of universities. I, I think it's remarkable in my lifetime that universities have come in the West to be uh, institutions that are simultaneously meant to be market institutions. We're meant to make money and to be profitable, to run ourselves as businesses. Uh, in the same breath, we're meant to obey government interference and administration, endless 
um, regulations that actually affect working lives and teaching and all that goes on in universities. And at the same time, we're meant to be public institutions that put on lectures like this. Uh, so there is a trend towards the you know, governmentalization of, of universities that happens in the case of China or Russia uh, in much more extreme uh, forms. So you have a point there, but I would say equally important is that um, when democracies are healthy, they contain within them um, institutions, networks, individuals, and groups who cause trouble, who cause trouble by saying things, uh, calling things by their own name, that expose things, that blow whistles, that monitor. And uh, you don't have to like Julian Assange, or you don't have to like uh, Edward Snowden, but you know, as a symbol of how monetary democracies function, that is the kind of, that is the kind of uh, rough and tumble uh, attempt to keep alive uh, public opinion, public controversy, to keep power on its toes, to prevent arbitrary power that marks off, I think, uh, democracies that still have uh, life in them. And as for the Koch brothers, um, perhaps we can end with them. I mean, I think that uh, I've just uh, published a book that includes uh, a whole section on um, these invisible connections that are now, if you look into them, are uh, beginning to shape actually existing democracies, connections that involved lobbyists, uh, that involve public opinion polling agencies, that involve um, public relations agents, that involve astroturfing, phenomena like astroturfing, that involve journalists um, sleeping with and cooperating with politicians. Uh, and this complex, this invisible um, uh, architecture of power is, I would say, deforming. Uh, the, the operations of uh, most actually existing democracies, in some cases, uh, in extreme ways. I suppose this is one way of uh, seeing the, the hacking scandal and the uh, behavior of news of the world and uh, news international and so on. It's one way of talking about the sort of cancerous effects uh, when that is un unchecked. Um, lobbying is a multi-zillion dollar industry. Uh, it's not all bad. Uh, some lobbyists actually do very good things in bringing to the attention of legislators issues that would otherwise not uh, uh, surface through parliaments or parties. But what we're witnessing, I think, in actually existing democracies is a sidestepping process, the development of parallel forms of power that are quite, um, quite outside the elect election cycle. Uh, that political parties have little control over um, and that tend, that tend to elude uh, public attention. And this lobbying is uh, not good because it is a form of, uh, of the encouragement, if you like, uh, the oiling of arbitrary uh, power. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think I, I said enough uh, tonight. I hope you will think about this uh, concept of despotism. Uh, it's not a popular term at all. Uh, you can do some Googling of it, and you'll find that do it doesn't bring up many uh, hits. It's all to do with the past. But it does seem to me that it's a concept uh, with a sting in its tail. It's a concept that has some analytic um, uh, 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 clarity. It's a concept that points towards the need for certain strategies for dealing with these trends. And it's a concept that ultimately forces us to think about what is so good about democracy. Um, we have been living through times where we take it for granted. Uh, we assume that elections are the backbone of democracies. Uh, if I'm right, then tonight I've tried to convince you that that is uh, actually rather simple-minded way, uh, ways of thinking about democracy. It raises the question of um, the dangers of arbitrary power in the 21st century, and it forces us to think about why it is that restraints on arbitrary power have to be given uh, entirely uh, new reasons, new reasons for restraining arbitrary power. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have, we really have to evacuate this room. We have no choice but to actually, a big thank you to Middle East Monitor, to Shazier, the Wood, to the speakers, um, Azam and John, really brilliant evening. And thank you all for being good listeners. And see you again.